Hi, everybody. We're back in the green room uh, having a chat. I, I don't know if you know what you do before you come out to do a TED Talk. It's you go back in the green room. There's uh, some extraordinary people out there, and it is an extraordinary honor for me to be here with you today. And I know what you're thinking. I'm not a doctor, but I'm from Ireland, so you don't have to worry if something bad goes wrong. You have an Irish person here to get you set. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to lay out some context for you about what it was like before TED Talks. So when I was growing up, there was no TED Talks, definitely, in Ireland. I was uh, born in 1981, so I am technically a millennial, even though I don't, don't look, walk, talk like them either. And we're going to talk on, about millennials today. And when I was born, Ronald Reagan had just taken office. And uh, if you see here on the right-hand side, that's a picture outside my back garden. It's a pretty big garden. And at the time, I definitely didn't think I was ever going to be in America where I am on the stage right now today. At the same time, my industry is cybersecurity, so it was the IBM had just released the PC, and Microsoft had put their software on it in a kind of a historic partnership. And, uh, but at 1992 was the first time that I put a stake in the ground and like, predicted what the future was going to be like. So if you get a sense of the context, at that time, we had President Clinton just been elected, and we had a former governor, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, was still pursuing a career in acting, where he'd just come out with Terminator 2. I presume you all know where you were when Terminator 2 came out, right? And uh, for me, I was in school. So you can see here, I'm back, back of the class, as usual. Uh, got the little circle on my head. And I actually wrote an article when I was 12 years old about computers. And as part of going through this process today, I made some predictions um, about the future. And uh, I was wrong uh, about a bunch of them. And I was right about one or two of them. And today, I'm going to take you through some of those predictions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, pr uh, the future that I think is, is coming as we all sit here today. So this is the article right here. You can see that was not my artistry on the bottom. I wish it was that good at drawing. But the first prediction I made was that if you bought, you should buy a Philips PC. That was the PC I recommended. It would cost you about 1,500 pounds, Irish punts at the time. And I, I, my bet was you could have that computer for a lifetime. So I was so far wrong about having a computer for a lifetime, now people have them for a day or two. The next prediction I made, I was, look, I was very good with the warning sign. I wanted to make sure everyone knew this is the warning part of the magazine that we were writing about. And uh, I said that your maximum amount of time you should spend is roughly half an hour. The computer can be addictive. And that's another reason why there should be a time limit on all computers. Now I was right. I wish I knew how right I was back then. I would have bet a lot bigger on it being uh, addictive. And then I was in protecting the computers. So here I have a whole section on protecting computers when I was 12 years old. And uh, back then, I was uh, more focused on the outside because my main recommendation is that you just put plastic on your computer and everything will be OK. And we've now migrated to the fact that uh, I spend all my life uh, trying to protect the inside of them. Um, but my dream was to make a difference in the world. And I think everybody here today wakes up every day with the same dream. Everybody wants to make a difference in the world. So my dream, when I was out the back looking at the garden, I always want to move to America. Because if I could have an impact in someone's life, in Ireland there was roughly 4 million at the time, and in the US there was over 300 million, I figured the US would be a lot bigger if it could have an impact. Turns out it is. And uh, so I... I was 23 years old, I got on a plane, and I flew to Florida, where everybody goes, because that was where I knew one person. And I ended up cleaning dishes in this restaurant. Uh, I cleaned dishes, and then I got promoted to cleaning glasses, and then I got promoted again to being a bar back, and ultimately became a bartender, where I served uh, uh, outside at this bar. Now, what I didn't know was Jupiter, Florida wasn't exactly America. It was the epicenter of kind of wealth in the United States. And every evening, I would have uh, all billionaires, different billionaires sitting in these seats. And I got a front row seat to some of the most successful people in the world. And what I did was I asked them a lot of questions. I was like, how do you, do you become successful? And everybody had the same answer. Everybody said, I worked really hard. Right? He said, yeah, he worked hard too. And then of the subset of people, only 10% of those people managed to have a successful relationship while they worked all those years. And I asked those people, I said, how did you 
manage to keep your relationship together when you were working so hard? They all had the same answer. They all said, you've got to make sure you marry a great person. And I'm very fortunate that I'm working very hard and I was able to marry a great person. And she's here, I see her sitting in the audience down there today. Now from here, I took some time and said to myself, all right, how do I get close to the success and hold on tight for the right? And I was very fortunate to build a company uh, and I worked on uh, a project called Hudson Yards. So it's basically the largest, uh, if you know where Sully landed the plane, it's right there in your heart of New York City. There was uh, uh, Steve Ross, who, who's my partner today. He owns an NFL football team, and he did this amazing development in New York. And right at the beginning, when we were, when we were looking at this project, you know, one of the amazing things about Steve is he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, if you bet small and you win, you've lost. So I wanted to find a sector, something that I could be passionate about, and make a big bet to see if we could make um, a difference in the world. And at the core reason for me, to doing this, for, for me to do this was I believed everybody wants to feel safe. You are going to hear some talks later today and some of the ones that happened already. And I think to unlock innovation in all these sectors, people are going to feel safe. And that was something that if I could work on, I thought that would be worth doing. I didn't know at the same time we were sitting at the forefront of an industrial revolution. So we're here in Fairfield University, the new school, uh, uh, the School of Engineering 25 year anniversary at a time when there is so many trends going on in the world, any one of these could create an industrial revolution. The first one, big buzzword everywhere now is AI. My mother told me the only, the only intelligence I would ever have when I was at work was artificial. So I'm uniquely suited to talk about that. At the same time, we have privacy legislation changing the world. Everybody cares now about uh, their data and they have rights to it and privacy is a right that everybody in here has. We have IoT, if you think about the connected world that we live in, everybody here has had multiple connections with the internet today. You look at Alexa and Siri and voice in your home and it's with you every day and you have earbuds probably from your uh, Apple device that you sits right in here and audio is actually something that not a lot of people are talking about, but the connected devices are going to touch every part of your body. Quantum computing, if you think of the compute power it takes for a, th for a computer to do something for a thousand years, we'll be able to do that in seconds. There's actually a breakthrough this very week on quantum computing by Google. And augmented reality and virtual reality will change, particularly retail as we know it. So people ask me all the time, what's it like uh, in cybersecurity? And I tell them it's like riding a tiger. When you have a tiger, you know, you see a guy on top, you say, how did he get on that tiger? How did he get the saddle on the tiger? How is he holding on so much? And when you're in cybersecurity, you're like, oh my God, I hope my arms don't get eaten. And this is a picture of what it's like for me every day. This is somebody I work with, uh, had this picture done up a year ago. I'm really disappointed. I don't think it's a fair reflection of my chin. So I'm going to get it redone. I'm going to try and have it redone. But essentially, this is what it's like for me in cyber every day. So why is it such a hard problem? Well, we, we have more data that's been created in the last three years than in the history of mankind. Now, now take a minute to think about that. More data created in the last three years than in the history of mankind. And that curve is only going up. At the same time, we have an epidemic shortage of cyber talent. So there's three million job openings in security today. Now when you have the data going up and you have the shortage of talent like that, you're very fortunate today to hear all these amazing doctors. But what if we had a problem that we didn't have a doctor for? What would it be like to deal with that problem? Combine that with the fact there is such a huge challenge around communication with this industry in particular. The IT and security community, they communicate in bits and bytes. They use words like cookies and worms and phishing. And regular people, when they think about these terms, they think of a, a cookie, a worm, and phishing. So we are in, a, in an environment today where that communication challenge, combine that with the fact that these two companies, uh, if you combine, you know, if you took out your phone and you opened up Google, which I'm sure you all do multiple times a day, 
and you type in Amazon, you have to go through nine pages before you find out that it's a forest, not an e-commerce company. So people who were born in this moment in time, they, you know, they are going to grow up in a world that it's almost hard for you to imagine in terms of digitization. And then when you have bad people with this landscape happening at the same time, it presents tremendous opportunity for them to do bad things. But the good news is that 99.99% of all attacks happen the same way. Everybody cares about something deeply. So all cyber and all attacks, you can, you can basically say that they're either trying to attack your identity, execute on your machine or your information, or send in a denial of service so you don't get access to something. And all you have to do is focus on the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the information and systems that you care about most. So every cyber attack you hear in the news, you can boil it down to is it the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of information and systems. When you look at uh, Andrew Maslow, uh, he was very much ahead of his time. And he knew that safety was a requirement for everybody to thrive. And you think about the digital footprint that people are leaving today. I want you to know that every digital footprint you leave, it matters. And if you think about when I was back in Ireland and I was making those predictions, there was indicators like the addictiveness of technology that some of these things were going to be a big deal in the future. So today, we're going to talk about some of these predictions that I think are really, we're getting real live indicators of problems that are happening. Mark Benioff is the CEO of Salesforce. And he said that Facebook is the new cigarettes. So I bet you everybody in this room has some, some Facebook account, whether you're on WhatsApp, whether you're on Instagram, and you'd like to spend more, uh, less time on it than you do. And that's what it was like with smoking in the beginning. The problem had a lot of like, very addictive habits to it and very difficult to kick. At the same time, this company uh, is, has the future of democracy in its hands. And the future of democracy sits in our private sector today. That has never happened before. It was always with the government sector. At the same time, we're trying to change privacy regulations so that you get that right that you deserve. At the same time, every individual in here will gather hundreds and thousands of connections to the internet every day. And it, not everybody in here thinks about their data in the same way. So we will eventually create a subprime of data where you get paid for allowing advertisers to harvest your information. Not everybody wants to be protected the same way. When you have artificial intelligence, and there is some amazing innovations that will come with AI, I want you to know that it can be used for good and for bad. I want you to know that every IT provider you know is doing heroic work, and all these people will have to become cyber providers. I know at some point we will have to think about building a new internet because anything that's fundamentally open, it's difficult to close. We'll have to think about it and design it in a new way. And if you have a problem, there is no 911 for cyber. There's no place to call. There is no emergency services. So I still believe that everybody in here wants to make a difference in the world. The millennial generation and Gen Z are the first generation that have really put their feet forward and said that they are going to hold companies accountable for what they do. And that presents an amazing opportunity for everybody in here today to encourage that type of behavior. Because I know you all care about someone deeply. These are the people who I care about deeply. So two years ago, my son Liam, who's sitting up front there, was diagnosed with autism. And I think about the autism research that's happening all over the world. That's what I care about. What would happen if something affected the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of that information? I know that you have a digital footprint and you have somebody that you care about. I want you to think about how you can change the world by caring about it more every day. Thank you.